and people will. Okay, so we are now recording. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, welcome everyone to um, our 10 o'clock session, Eastern Standard Time at OE Global. My name is Lena Patterson. I'm so pleased to invite you here to this presentation um, with James Glapagrosglide, Cable Green, Kurt Newton, and Lisa Petrides. And I'm going to ask them all to um, introduce themselves and, and take it away. Thank you so much, Lena, for the introduction, and uh, it's great to uh, to see all of you turned out for this uh, for this conversation. Really excited to uh, um, reflect back on some of the work that we've been doing in this uh, Open 2020 Working Group. You know, share some of our thinking, and more importantly, engage in a conversation with you all about um, the direction that these conversations are heading. Uh, as uh, as Lena mentioned, I'm you know joined here by you know several members, uh, participants in the in the working group. Um, we've got uh, James Clapper, uh, Grossclag, Cable Green, Peter Kaufman, and uh, Lisa Petrides. Um, and I'll ask them in in a moment to uh, to go around and, and just give a little more introduction, you know, from their perspective about the work that they do and. Uh, and, and how it connects into the bigger picture. Well, let me begin by uh, uh, reflecting on the nature of this group, where it came from, what its goals were, uh, just as a, as a way to frame the conversation. Um, so the Open 2020 Working Group was, uh, was convened, you know, uh, you know, by MIT Open Learning and a number of our colleagues in, in, the, in this broader mission. Uh, to just take stock of where we are, you know, roughly 20 years after the founding of MIT OpenCourseWare and the launch of, you know, what really has become a, a, a massive and diverse uh, movement, um, uh, where are we? What are the what are the what are the grand themes that are that are playing out there? And especially as we might be able to to have conversations across the different sectors from this rich and diverse ecosystem. What are, what are some new opportunities for us to, to work together, to collaborate, um, to develop you know, uh, new capacities that are, that are fitting for the next 20 years of, of open learning? Um, so we pulled people together from a number of different sectors, uh, you know, tried to get together on an on a, a occasional sort of quarterly basis physically uh, to, um, to bring our, our visions together, think about, reflect upon, the best practices that were emerging in different sectors and uh, and try to crystallize some ideas and, and move things forward. Um, there are materials that we've documented as we went through this process that are available on a wiki. Um, and I put the, the link to the wiki in the, uh, the description for this event, but I'll, uh, I'll drop it into the chat here. Uh, as, as we uh, continue on with, so I'll kick off the introduction round. So I'm a director of MIT OpenCourseWare. I've, uh, I've worked uh, for OpenCourseWare since 2004, a couple years after it founded, um, became director a couple years ago. And I'm particularly, you know, you know, thrilled to be working at this moment when there are, there are so many, you know, opportunities that are opening up as, um, the world is is understanding what open education and open knowledge more generally is capable of creating. Um, like to hand off uh, now to uh, let's see, we'll go in order of uh, James Cable. This is alphabetical. James Cable, Peter, and Lisa. And if each of you would like to uh, just take a couple minutes to introduce yourselves and uh, tell us about your work. Sure, thanks, Kurt. Hey, everybody, it's great to be here. Good morning from Los Angeles. Uh, my name is James. Um, I, my day job is with College of the Canyons, where I'm a dean, and College of the Canyons is uh, one of the 115 California community colleges, and the California community colleges comprise the largest system of higher education in the United States, and community colleges overall serve about 50% of all students in the United States, so uh, uh, we're very much uh, 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 in the mainstream of education and really uh, focused on teaching. Uh, my work has focused uh, most recently on uh, helping other community colleges to develop Z degrees or zero textbook cost pathways built around open educational resources. Uh, I've also been uh, deeply involved with, the, with our host organization, Open Education Global. I'm a 
past president of the board and just really happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks, James. Hi, everybody. My name is Cable Green. I'm the director of open education at Creative Commons. I've been at CC for uh, about 10 years before that, worked in uh, community colleges and in systems of higher education across the US. Looking forward to today's conversation. Peter, is that you? You're up next. Hi, sorry, alphabet is tricky. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Peter Kaufman at MIT Open Learning. Thank you so much everyone for joining from all over uh, the place. Um, I work in strategic initiatives and some resource development at, um, at Open Learning. And one of the strategic initiatives I've been lucky enough to um, um, work on is this Open 2020 working group um, uh, with Kurt and, and with others who are uh, speaking today. So, and others who are um, in attendance and participating on the call today. So thank you again for the opportunity. Okay. I'm Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Petrides, and I am uh, president and founder of ISCME, the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. And since 2007, we have been uh, running a open education library called OER Commons. And we also run another couple of dozen of libraries for institutions and in higher ed, K-12 and ministries of education around the globe, trying to um, entice and support uh, the discovery, sharing and collaboration around open educational resources. And I'm also the proud uh, trustee elect of uh, a, my local community college district here in California. And just delighted to be here on this conversation today with you all. Yeah, thanks, thanks Lisa. Yeah, um, uh, as Peter noted, we have a few other members uh, from the working group who are also uh, in the participants. Uh, and as we, as we go through here, you know, if we want this to be, you know, uh, to open up into a dialogue and a discussion and uh, hope that we'll get to uh, to hear from some of them as well. Um, we've got, uh, uh, who did I see? Ryan Erickson Coolis, we've got Richard Sebastian, uh, we've got Willem also. Um, I may have missed others too, but I uh, noticed, I know at least several others coming in on the chat. So that's great. Um, so I wanted to start off by, um, by reflecting on um, this kind of vision statement process that began with that we began with about 18 months ago when the group kicked off, um, acknowledging that we come from you know you know a, a wide range of different sectors and the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is really grounded in 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 all these different realities. We asked uh, the participants in the group to um, you know uh, their view of of. Uh, you know, what their vision statement was for for open education, what what they what they would like it to be now, and what they'd like to become in the future. Um, a lot has gone on in the last eighteen months. You know, some of it, I'll say, planned, but a lot of it unplanned, a lot of it disruptive. And I'd like to uh, to ask our panelists, you know, to reflect on their view of of their vision for open education and how that's how that's evolved, say, over the past couple of years. Um, let me uh, we start. We'll go. Uh, we'll start by the same uh, the same order, if we may. Uh, James, would you like to uh, to reflect on that? Yeah. Thanks, Kurt. Well, you know, when I when I think back to uh, was it a year, year and a half ago when we first convened, uh, one of the one of the um, major points that I that I tried to tried to make was. Uh, to focus on the needs of learners and what, what the ultimate needs of our learners are, uh, whether they're formal learners or informal learners. Um, but our need, the needs of our learners go beyond uh, simple instructional materials, right? If we, if we talk about uh, moving from costly instructional materials or closed knowledge to free instructional materials and open knowledge, that's great, but that's not really what our learners are, are, are after. Uh, our learners are after uh, skills, knowledge, a better life, full participation in civil society, uh, particularly those of us who are involved in community colleges, you know, really focus on expanding 
uh, access and bringing more people into higher education. Uh, I, so again, that, that was one of the main points that I was trying to make uh, throughout our conversations over the past uh, year and year and a half. And, and I think if anything, uh, I feel more urgent about that today than, than when we first convened uh, with what we see going on in, in, in American politics, but certainly in politics all over the world. Uh, uh, there's, there's, there's more of an attempt, I think, by some traditional elites to close knowledge and to uh, uh, erect, erect barriers to access uh, and, and full participation in, in civil society. Our friend Katsu Shigetsu uh, yesterday in the, in the opening session uh, giving us a tour of what's going on in Asia uh, made the point that uh, uh, when, when, when uh, Japan Open Courseware first started, uh, they, were, they encountered a lot of opposition from uh, traditional academics, precisely because, as he put it, uh, uh, education was about secrecy and, uh, and open education threatened the secrecy of knowledge. So I feel, yeah, again, a greater sense of urgency about breaking down the barriers than, than I did a year ago. Great. Thanks, James. Uh, Cable, I think you're next. All right. Uh, let me just make sure I'm unmuted. There we go. <laughs> uh, let's see, last few years. Um, I would say two big things changed in my view. Uh, one was we got what's called the UNESCO recommendation on open education resources. So uh, for those of you that follow what UNESCO does in this space, they have over time all the way back to 2002 been very involved in the open education space, particularly in the open content space in OER. Um, in 2002, they coined the term OER. Uh, in 2012, there was the, uh, the declaration on OER from UNESCO, which was essentially a heads up to governments around the world that this was something that was important that they ought to think about as they are planning and uh, working on reforms within their education systems. Uh, and then in 2017, there was a big World OER Congress where five years after the declaration, countries came together and said, here's the progress we've made, here are the challenges we're still having. And then just this past November in 2019, uh, the UNESCO member states at their general conference unanimously adopted the UNESCO recommendation on OER. So if you haven't seen this, I'll share the link in the chat after, uh, after I stop talking here. Um, it's worth reading. And what's important about it is it's an international framework from an international governmental organization uh, and one uh, that's part of the family of the United Nations that says, you know, hey, governments of the world, open education is important. And here are the very specific actions that your government can take to advance open education in your countries. And not just about content, but around policy, procurement, sustainability, uh, professional development opportunities. There's a whole slate of activities um, at a very specific level. Uh, and then the, the various NGOs of the world, uh, ISKME, Creative Commons, uh, OE Global, Spark, OER Africa, many NGOs have come together, and that's not an exhaustive list, to uh, work together to collaboratively help these national governments learn about and implement this recommendation that they all voted yes on. So I think that's a big deal. That sort of the end state of that is to solve what's called out in sustainable goal Sustainable Development Goal number four, which is all about access to education for everybody. The second big thing uh, that I think we've seen uh, really in the last probably three years is this um, acknowledging that content is still really important and policy work is still critical, but to really go after and talk a lot and spend more time and effort on the third area of open education, which is really inclusive pedagogy. Um, and there's, uh, with everything that's been going on in the world from COVID to uh, looking at systematic racism in, in our uh, systems of government, education, various sectors of society, uh, a big discussion about open education being uh, a place to have conversations about uh, equity, about social justice, and um, not as the only solution for that, but as part of the solution. And so there's a lot of work happening right now to think about who's developing the OER? Where is it coming from? Whose voices are in that conversations? Is it, uh, is it supply or demand driven? 
Uh, what do the supply chains look like? Um, how do we make sure that uh, everybody is uh, is involved in these conversations and not just uh, not just a few from uh, one part of the world? Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Peter, over to you. So I'm really grateful to be part of this Open 2020 Working Group, as I said, because it includes so many, uh, such a combination, I guess, of, of visionaries and, and uh, activists, um, um, it, but also like practical people, implementers, if that's a word. I don't know if that's a word, but let's try it. Um, uh, and, you know, the challenges that we face um, as educators and as people who work in the information or even media environment are um, weirdly growing, um, deepening. Um, since even we started this in May, uh, and thanks to the generous support uh, um, of uh, one of our co-conveners, the, the Hewlett Foundation, um, uh, where we had our last, uh, our third most recent meeting. Um, we had a conversation at CC Global touching on some of these um, uh, challenges. Um, but one that I would like to highlight for us now is like, how does the work um, that goes into open education um, itself fit into the larger framework, the larger progressive framework of information and sort of free knowledge, the kind of things that you will see in, if you read nothing else about this working group and never visit with us again, just take a look at the um, sort of the mission, uh, ideals, vision statements that Kurt um, thought of asking our, our group for at the very beginning in May of last year. They're on, on the wiki. They're incredibly moving. Um, how does our work fit into this larger progressive framework of, of information, knowledge, and media that Cable uh, was also addressing? Um, between the third meeting that we had of this four meeting year that we envisioned and the fourth meeting, which is still to happen. We've had like pre-meetings and like prep meetings for the fourth meeting. But between those two meetings, um, you know, a lot happened, including some of the things that um, previous speakers mentioned, such as the pandemic, which flipped us all on our heads. Um, even though MIT and others have been thinking and prepping and are, you know, probably every member of this conversation today about uh, online learning, um, the emergency heightened. Um, but also, you know, the country, parts of it caught on fire again. And, and um, these issues uh, of systemic racism, and I know we have a later call today about some of these questions, like um, equality, um, justice, and freedom became, um, yeah, rose to the fore in ways that, you know, made our mandate even more kind of explicit. And, you know, so I'll say there's a lot of talk about suppression in the news these days, these hours, but there's a suppression of like basic reason that's going on, of facts, of verifiable truths. And while the rights to publish those things are not necessarily part of the sustainable development goals, that we talk about sometimes in our in our working group. They're not one of the 17. Indeed, education in our country is not an explicit right in our constitution. We have like, we're, we're there are 180 countries where education is in the constitution. Ours is not one of them. But there is a universal declaration of human rights that calls these things out. The freedom of expression, uh, the freedom of information uh, and the right to education. And we need to think about how we can do better um, in all of our online work to fulfill those grand visions um, uh, in this moment of, of pandemic and systemic uh, uh, racism. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Lisa, how's, how's your vision doing? Yeah, thank you. And certainly echoing some of the things that my colleagues have just covered. Um, I guess the first one I just want to start where Peter left off was around inclusion and how the absolute necessity of bringing uh, a more inclusive perspective into open education 
uh, who are those partners that can do that with us? How can they be supported uh, for bringing in their content and their practices uh, and their stories? So it isn't just about how do we find that content and, and, and popularize it, but really how do we engage uh, in the collaboration of those communities that we have not yet really engaged with? Um, and this also includes uh, folks who are doing just terrific work around uh, social emotional learning and global climate change and the diversity and social justice issues. How do we really bring them into the fold? And we've started to see, I think in the last 18 months, how we can move forward from a community that has been somewhat narrowly focused on kind of the principles and the ethos of open, um, moving towards the infrastructure and the policy recommendations, all the way to implementations in the classroom as, as we define that remotely today. Uh, so that shift, I think, where I'm really, really starting to see in the last 18 months, particularly in those who, um, who really are engaging in the community in ways that we hadn't before. Um, I think the second piece really kind of dovetails on that, that is, there is just much more support and backup for the perspective around open education. So, you know, that it's affordable, yes, that we have free textbooks, yes, you know, but that now we're really getting that collaboration and support for teaching and learning. There's been a huge emphasis on professional development in the last eight months, not just here in the US, but around the world. That's a, a just a welcome opportunity to be bringing an open education approach into that. Uh, similarly, the intersection of sort of the disciplines, um, the professional subject areas, uh, and perhaps more importantly, what I'm really seeing now is the, we're finally seeing the connection of these top-down efforts with the bottom-up initiatives. So we've had both for some time. I think, uh, you, uh, Cable, you mentioned UNESCO um, and the SDG goals. That's a perfect example. It's, it was sort of a hat tip to government saying, yep, get involved, we're, we're on this. And, and many were, and so they are now kind of reaching down to the implementers and similarly, some of the amazing grassroots efforts that have blown into full, you know, full blossom open education, you know, from OER Africa to, I mean, there's just, there's so many of, of these um, that are doing that now. So, so essentially it's the intersection, it's the finally the meeting of kind of the bottom up initiatives and the top down, um, uh, policy and mandates that really do have to be in place uh, to make this kind of more of a sustainable endeavor. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, I completely share uh, the excitement with you, Lisa, about the seeing the, uh, the bottom up and top down starting to meet in these really interesting places. Um, curious what people are seeing about um, how well we're doing at, um, at sharing uh, the things that are coming up from this incredibly rich, diverse, kind of grassroots uh, activities that are going on, things that are so grounded in, in the local needs, um, the way that learners and educators are trying to work with things. How are we doing at um, sharing those learnings more broadly and creating the kind of collaborations and infrastructure that we need so that, you know, within that incredibly diverse uh, situation, um, we're we're building, we're all building collectively. Um, what, what are you seeing? How's, how's that feeling to you? Well, I'll, I'll start off, Kurt. Uh, I, I'd say I'm, I'm very uh, inspired by the uh, Open Education Conference that took place, uh, that was centered or hosted in the United States last week, had, uh, which attracted 1,500 participants. Uh, just two years ago, the conference attracted 400 participants. Then last year it was 800, and this year it was 1,500. And the central theme of the conference was equity, diversity, and inclusion. So bringing more people into the fold and more people into the idea of open education, but also recentering uh, or centering the purpose and being explicit about what the purpose is of open education. And that is to, again, uh, uh, bring more people in, uh, help more people and more perspectives and more stories and more voices uh, fully participate in society and shape our future and not receive knowledge from someone else or some other entity. Uh, so I think that's incredibly inspiring. Uh, and that's coming from the grassroots, really. And, and, and 
that's also what I see in, in my very local work or my work in California, namely that the uh, typical faculty member who is interested in open education uh, or adopting OER, creating OER, is doing so more uh, these days out of a sense of, of uh, reshaping the narrative, reshaping the materials that students are using in the classroom away from that received elite knowledge that's produced by some commercial publisher a million miles away and that is more focused on uh, the, the, the community of students that you see in front of, in front of you. Uh, so I, I'm really inspired by that. Nevertheless, as, as, as Cable mentioned and others have mentioned, uh, within the United States, at least, there's a, a very urgent uh, task to uh, bring more voices and perspectives into the field of open education. As much as you can call open education a field, it's a, in, in the United States, it's a, uh, a blindingly white field uh, that reflects white culture uh, and white, white approaches to education. So we, we really have to be very uh, intentional about uh, uh, moving beyond that. So back to you then. Yeah, yeah, that brings to mind uh, something you had, uh, a way you'd asked the question, James, in a, in, a, in a previous conversation about like, you know, to bring in those voices. What if we were more intentional about bringing in folks who don't think of themselves as part of open education, but whose goals are so directly aligned with what we're doing that um, make really powerful common cause and uh, where, where might some of those opportunities be? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Kurt. Uh, you know, at, at the risk of being, being cr you know, s critical of, of myself and my, my friends here, you know, I think open education to a large extent, at least in the United States and, and to some extent in, in Europe, has been quite insular, and Lisa referred to this, quite, quite self-satisfied. You know, we're doing a wonderful job because, because of whatever metrics we're pointing to. Because um, we have this, you know, wonderful, wonderful, these wonderful conferences, and we have wonderful conversations with one another, uh, but we're not necessarily uh, framing ourselves or describing ourselves as a tool to achieve larger goals. What are the larger goals that we're actually after? Is the end goal that everybody uses an open textbook? Well, no. What is the end goal that forces us to ask that question and to present ourselves as tools to achieve larger goals? that align with other education reform efforts or other civil society organizations. So that, that's kind of a very broad answer to the statement, but I think we, it's really important for us to, to, to get out of our own conversation and to, to, join, to join other organizations. Yeah, I, I want to just add to that. And uh, uh, for, for those of you who are who have your video on, um, it was a very foggy morning here in Half Moon Bay, and the sun just came out, which you can see. So I'm, I'm going to have to get up and close a shade in a minute, but I'm, I'm blinded by the light, which seems to be a good metaphor at this moment here. Um, you know, following on what James said, I I think to what we what we're going to see and what 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 we really need to do as a field is to acknowledge that sort of where are these tendrils kind of uh, of the, the groups that have not been actively involved in those communities. And what does it mean to kind of have the, 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 the power distributed throughout uh, these communities as well? Because it has been somewhat insular and, and therefore you know, somewhat siloed from some of these other systems. And, that can be everything from technical infrastructure, like the importance of taking all of our libraries and making sure they integrate with everybody's learning management systems to uh, where are other um, centers of some centers of gravity, you know, where are other um, existing fields that have their own structures and, and, and power structures. How are, how do they now step in with in their own communities and that they don't have to become just sort of absorbed into what we know as the community. And, and I think there's a certain kind of letting go um, of, of what we have today to be able to do that and to really just be open and listen to saying, where are those things? And, you know, and they're coming from, you know, they're coming from the historically black colleges and universities here in the US. They're coming from discipline specific uh, professional organization, trade organizations, which have a lot of content knowledge which uh, people haven't really bothered to say, where is that 
you know, where is that knowledge and how is that knowledge being transferred um, openly um, in prison education programs, right? There's so many areas that uh, we have just begun to kind of scratch the surface of. Yeah, yeah. I think I, uh, I noticed uh, at Open Ed last week, there was a session on welding, right? <laughs> How exciting. Uh, Peter, you've had your hand up uh, and then we're starting to see great some uh, questions coming up in the chat. So yeah. uh, no, just for a second, I, I you know, it would be great if we turn our attention in that direction too. Yeah, if, if we can like um, with our mission drive and with some of these principles that are in the vision statements, like s s jump species like the virus does and go like outside of education to other forms of activism and like what, how can we facilitate as open education people, the anti-racism movement? How can we facilitate anti, you know, um, uh, the right kind of activism in, in the climate challenges that we're facing or in economic equality? Like what can we do and what are, you know, to James's point, which he's reiterated in our in our in our group conversations. What does that map look like? Who are those players, and how do we build those those natural along those on those natural affinities um, for you know identifying which which group are we going to work with in this area, and which that to me can then render you know a fifteen hundred person conference, God forbid, to a 15,000 person conference and, and then some in there. Excellent. Cable, you had your hand there? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short, Kurt, so we can get to other people's questions. Um, so two quick thoughts, one about vision and one about themes on this same idea of the open ed field reaching out. Um, I, I've been working with two organizations recently that are both thinking about systematic racism, but the way that they're acting is they are uh, building new educational resources for young kids who are in school. So this is like grades two through five. And they're building a whole new curriculum that is it's modeled on, you know, long arc of history, but it's, you know, it's an honest history of in this in this particular case, it's targeted at US schools. And so they're taking you know, an, an actual honest look at racism in the United States and where it came from and how it manifests itself today. And so their vision, if you will, is to get these materials broadly adopted to provide professional development around them um, so that the next generation of you know, students that come up through the education system <clears throat> actually have an honest look at what actually happened and how systematic racism, why it exists in the first place. Um, which is, you know, something that a lot of us never got until we were in college and were in these classes, which were, you know, <laughs> critical thought classes that actually looked at how all this came to be. And so when I say vision, what I mean is I'm now talking with them saying, well, if that's your vision, then, you know, you might consider open as a way of accelerating your vision, putting your vision on steroids, if you will, because we can get, if we openly license it, if we put it over in OER Commons where people can find it, if we you know, advertise it, if we do the following, we can actually get this out. It can be translated into different languages. And that seems to be aligning. And so they're now openly licensing their works and turning it into OER. Um, the second one is, is themes. This really builds on what Lisa and James were saying. I think there are common themes out there that span different, uh, different NGO efforts. So you know, one of them is access to education. So certainly that's what we're about in open education. That's a big part of why we all do it. Well, so does, so does Black Lives Matter. They care a lot about access to uh, education. So does, um, well, just a few years ago, Lisa brought the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, to an open education conference. And there was a rich conversation about, hey, we have this shared goal of access to education for everybody. So I, you know, another theme is open access to knowledge to help people. And so right now you're seeing at UNESCO, they already have a recommendation on open education or on OER. They're now building and have open for comment, a recommendation on open science. And of course it's been accelerated because of COVID and everybody knows that open science is the right way to do science. If we wanna 
cure diseases, you better make sure that the research and the data is all openly, not only accessible and freely accessible, but is openly licensed. So it can be text and data mined, et cetera. And so um, I think it's not rocket science. We just haven't thought this way before. We really have to, I think, look at what are our core themes that we care about, and then do a bit of an analysis of who else has those core themes or those core goals as well and start to reach out. Thanks. Um, I see, James, you got your hand up. I'm also wanting to start pulling in some of the, um, of the conversation that's going on in the chat. Or may I, may I pull that in? The, uh, the chat. Okay, so 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 real brief. That just to pick up on Cable's point, it was a thousand percent plus plus a thousand percent cable, absolutely, absolutely. And it also, uh, one can get to this point by uh, of of saying that we need to expand our allies and present ourselves as tools or mechanisms for other movements by following the data. Look at the data in education, at least in my context. You know, you start looking at well what groups of students are not succeeding? They're not succeeding because they can't get in to education or they're not succeeding because of financial barriers. You start peeling away that data and in the United States context, you very quickly arrive at uh, uh, populations of stu students from uh, ethnic minorities or racial minorities. Uh, so, so that's a natural point of connection to those organizations that Cable was mentioning. But outside the context of the United States, I would suggest that you have the similar opportunity and you have to, to follow the data. What, what populations of students are facing barriers uh, or are, are not succeeding at the rate of the majority uh, students or students from the majority culture? Are they linguistic uh, minorities in your country? Are they uh, people who are min minoritized or excluded for, for, for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, those uh, organizations that work with those types of students who are not successful or who are facing barriers uh, based on the data would also be uh, likely allies. So back back to you, Chris. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, Lena asked a few minutes ago, does openness become a principle or value rather than a discipline? I, I, uh, if, if I get that, uh, if I understand what you're saying, uh, should we have a, a, a motto like open education? It's not just for open education practitioners. It's for everybody. You know, um, the, the people who are creating this, um, this uh, young person's curriculum didn't think of themselves as open education people, but there's huge value in that. And uh, reflecting back on a, a prior conversation uh, with you, Lisa, you had asked something along the lines of like, what does it look like or what do we need to do to make these practices really become the default rather than a thing that gets bolted on to the side. It feels like there's, you know, tremendous opportunity, you know, potential to, to get into um, really addressing some of the big challenges that we, we all see uh, if we can find our ways to do that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I would love to, to address that. I think, apps, you know, I think that it's a we started it sort of as a movement, you know, this was 2003, 2004. Uh, within five or six years, as we had research, uh, some great research uh, from, uh, from, from Dave Wiley, and I mean, there's, there's been a lot of uh, ground building work that had to be done around just substantiating that, in fact, open was as good as uh, proprietary. And then we had to look at classroom impact and then we had to look at educator uptake right there's been so there's been sort of a body of, of research on the you know that has said you know here's the work that where it's moved from a movement to a field i think that that has limited us now in fact if we just think of it as a field and we are not fully integrated with all fields and that it isn't just this add-on piece and that in fact it's even more than a principle i think it's an approach um, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a whole field of open pedagogy now, which is really uh, embrace this in this way. Uh, so I think the more that we continue to think of open education sort of as its own field, it's going to be a detriment in some ways to, um, to really thinking about how as a public good, you know, education as, as a human right, right, we have to go all the way into places and people and communities 
that frankly don't know about open source software whose shoulders we we stand on or they don't they, they don't know about open science they might be the beneficiaries of that um, and and i kind of want to say do they have to know all the background of what open is and the arguments around licensing and infrastructure like like that's not even you know th those were so important so he, i'm not trying to trivialize those i'm saying building the groundswell you know was critical to have that research to have those conversations and debates it's now time to really i think bust that open yes <laughs> Uh, uh, open it up to the panel. Any other observations along those lines? No? Okay. Um, I would um, encourage anybody who's in the audience uh, to, uh, to continue to put your questions and observations in on the chat. Uh, and in fact, we have from Richard who has been uh, in, the, uh, in the working group with us um, Regarding the insularity, how can we broaden input and participation beyond membership and hear input from communities that we don't hear so often? Um, I would go so far as to say this is one of the things that we want to do. I know is to uh, is to get out of our out of our meetings and start to have conversations more broadly. Um, but I'd love to hear thoughts from uh, from other panelists on that. Peter. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if there's a way to jujitsu the whole pandemic thing and try to figure out how to take advantage of what is, you know, this once in a century horror that's visiting upon us, we are educating ourselves via Zoom or other, you know, screen technologies now. Uh, and we're doing it on kind of an emergency basis but what are the principles that we should be thinking about? Open ed and OER in particular has been a very text centric movement. We're now communicating via video and audio. What are the principles that should be enshrined in our teaching and learning um, in these, so that we don't get caught up in, you know, what 600 years of print has brought us to date, which is a mess um, when it comes to this kind of licensing. So we should be thinking about that and we should be taking advantage of the fact that we're recording whole loads of courses, um, uh, not, you know, everywhere. Uh, how can we share them? When Kurt, I'll, I'll pick up on that, uh, the, the point about uh, educating ourselves or, or, or capturing the content that, we, that we're, we're producing now and as part of professional development. Uh, I think a lot of us here, uh, certainly participate in professional development or create professional development opportunities for our networks, for our colleagues. As we're doing that, let's not repeat ourselves and let's not have, as, as Lisa was sort of suggesting, let, let's not offer one more webinar on licensing, uh, apologies to cable, I guess, let, let's have a, li on a webinar on licensing, but let's not have a second webinar on licensing. Let's have a, the second webinar be about uh, the question of anti-racism. Uh, another, to have the second webinar be about the, the historical practices in whatever part of the world you're from that made one culture the dominant culture in education and other cultures minoritized. Um, so we, we all can wield that influence as we're educating ourselves, I hope, uh, to move beyond the insularity uh, let's share that learning with others. Uh, personally, I've, I've, I've benefited from the, the generosity of the, of the Hewlett Foundation and the Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation to connect with other organizations in the United States who are working on education reform for particular populations. And I've just begun having conversations with them. And I'll, I'll, I will then be inviting them uh, to uh, share their, uh, their, their perspectives and what their organizations do with groups of people that I get to work with in the open, based on open education, but I'll be expanding the knowledge of everybody, hopefully. Yeah, good. I'd like to welcome into the room one of our elephants. Thank you, Sean, for bringing, bringing them in. Uh, the question of uh, commercial companies, the tension that exists between 
OER as this ideologically free resource and the need to, for it to be financially and otherwise sustainable. Um, this runs, you know, this is a rich undercurrent through a lot of our work and a lot of our conversations. And I'd like to uh, put that out to the panel for uh, reflections on where that stands uh, at this moment and where we should be trying to lead it. I'd like to maybe at least to start by offering kind of a re even a reframing of that question because for the last 10 years, uh, I think we've been asking, or this question has been asked of us, um, how can it be sustainable if it's not commercial? And I wanna reframe that and say, you know, look at the uh, cable can give us these numbers the best probably, you know, the $6 billion a year that are already committed and spent in K-12 education alone. Um, and then there's the, of course, the higher ed numbers, which are, which are even greater than that. Um, there's already money in our ecosystem and in our effort for these things. The idea, there are really two different questions about how to have a sustainable ecosystem versus commercial, you know, commercial use. And, and I think that some people might be thinking with that question when I saw it, you know, sort of some of the, um, I'm gonna say the bastardizations of open that we've seen through the years. Um, they're now uh, coming in the flavor and, and color of things like inclusive access or equitable access. We just all saw a tweet of a couple of weeks ago. Um, these are the responses of a lot of commercial publishers to OER as a way to essentially let's you know let's call the elephant what it is to kind of cut off open at its you know at its knees right so let's have those conversations about commercial enterprise its challenge to open its partnership with open where do we where have we seen productive um, collaborations that were meaningful in, in terms of outcome for students, right? Uh, not for shareholders, but for students. But then there's another conversation about, you know, what, what, what is sustainable and where is the money that has already been put into these things and how could it be better reallocated to the endeavors around open? I mean, PD, we just were talking about that, but just as an example, there's, a, there's been some money flowing into education around uh, around the CARES Act and the pandemic and uh, some you know really savvy smart uh, institutions and educators across the country are saying hey you know we already have all of this money for PD now we're getting CARES money for and it's not like it's you know we don't have all the money we need for PD but money's flowing in into PD we're talking about remote learning and what that means for teaching and learning, well, let's make sure we embed open into part of that learning. So what are those existing me mechanisms for the existing funds? We haven't even done that yet. So to somehow say, you know, commercial has to save it because that's how you make money to make it sustainable. They're really two, com two different conversations. So a friendly kind of reframing of that, at least from my perspective. Thanks, thanks. Cable, you had your hand up. Yeah, just to, to build on what Lisa was saying, um, so, so she's right. I, I do love that argument that we we have the money that we need. I always say we're just really bad at how we spend it. And so uh, the numbers are actually in the US are uh, almost double what, what Lisa laid out. It's in, in K-12, the US gov federal government puts between nine and 10 billion a year into K-12 public education, and it's a similar amount in higher ed. And it fluctuates depending on the year and the administration, but it's it's give or take nine to 10 billion. And um, so, you know, for me, when I think about, <laughs> when I sit down with a, an entity, whether we're talking about uh, developing a new policy um, or we're talking, you know, at a, at a federal level or we're at a national level, or if we're talking about um, procurement of educational resources at a local level, um, the you know, conversations are similar. It's is is open. If we take an open path, uh, is it going to be better? Is it going to be more cost efficient? Almost always, the answer is yes. And so, you know, today, uh, it, certainly in higher ed, uh, we're seeing this this pattern, and it's starting to hit K twelve now as well. Is we're seeing these models where the commercial sector won't even sell educational resources 
anymore. So the old model was in K-12 anyway, is that we'll sell you these resources. They're really expensive. And then the way that the school districts around uh, the country and in many countries around the world would deal with that high cost is they would keep those resources for over a decade and then amortize the cost over 10, 12 years. So where I live in Washington state, our educational resources in K-12 on average are about 11 and a half years old. And that's because we're amortizing these costs, which is insane, right? I've got, we've, we have a son in high school and his political science uh, textbook is 10 years old. And has anything interesting happened in political science in 10 years? I think so. <laughs> Lisa's been elected, that's what happened. So, uh, you know, like that's, that's completely unacceptable. And now when the school district acquires or procures uh, educational resources today, they don't even own them. They're leasing access to them. So I think part of our job is to point out the new models which have emerged from the commercial sector and how damaging they are, how unfair they are, how the districts and, and colleges and universities and students own nothing and yet they pay a large amount of money. And so it, it, going back to the OER recommendation from UNESCO, one of the things that we wrote into it was this idea of open procurement. And so, you know, it's one thing to have a national uh, open licensing policy. So for example, in the United States, the departments of labor, education, several programs in state, a uh, big chunk of USAID, their early childhood reading, they all require a Creative Commons attribution license when somebody takes a grant or contract from them. So whatever they build with this public money, must be openly licensed. So that's good. That's a top down angle on this. But it's also important that the local school district or the local uh, university or college has an open procurement policy that says if we're going to go spend, you know, a half million euros buying a set of educational resources, we need to make sure we're buying it. So we need to own it. We need to hold copyright. And then hopefully we have an internal open access policy that says we'll openly license those materials and turn them into OER. And so part of it is we don't spend our money very wisely uh, in how we allocate educational resources, professional development opportunities, et cetera. We've got the money, we're just bad at how we spend it. Another part of it is our collective failure to recognize that as long as we, the public, have the money, we have the power. Meaning the market should be viewed as work for hire for the public education sector. So we'll give you the money as soon as you meet our terms. And hopefully our terms are we, the public, own the copyright to what we're buying and or we're hiring you to go build what we want. But either way, we own it. You build for us, we pay you. And then we're gonna openly license it and share it as OER. Just that step you could reduce the nine or 10 billion in the United States by a significant amount and then shift that budget, right? We don't wanna give it back to the government. We want more professional development. We want more conversations about open pedagogy. We need better conversations about social justice. We need to get into the curriculum and fix the inequities. And so, um, you know, these, the opportunity is there. How do we get there? We need all of us, all of us at this conference and all the other conferences this fall to be involved in that work. And even then it's not enough of us, which is why these other professional development programs that are going on to train new leaders in open education are so critical. Well said, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of applause in the chat. Uh, James, you have your hand up. Uh, you're on mute. That, thank you. I, of course, com I agree completely with Lisa and Cable. Cable, Cable says that so so eloquently. I, I would just offer a couple of concrete examples to remind us that we're at a moment in history. One, you know, that, that it doesn't have to be the way it is. It can be what Cable's talking about. Uh, there was a time uh, 200 years ago when education was not public education. It wasn't a public good. There was a time when libraries were the purview of the rich and they were filled with secret information. Uh, like books. And there was a time when firefighters, fire, fire departments were only for the wealthy and they were private services. Uh, and, and somehow society has seen that these are public goods and they, that everyone benefits when a town doesn't burn to the ground. Everyone benefits when there's literacy and so on. So it's super important that we, that we insist on changing the framework, changing the perspective, and we don't accept the, the terms of the discussion that others give us. Good, good. Yeah, um, Kurt, I don't know why, Kurt, but every, 
So I just wanted to jump in and say we actually only have uh, just six minutes remaining. I, this hour has flown by, so I just wanted to do my duty and Thanks. give you your 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 warning to start wrapping it up. Yeah, thank you. I think this gives everybody a, a, a flavor for what these conversations when the working group gets together are like. The time does fly by. Um, yeah, I don't know why. Everything reminds me of climate change these days. This feels very similar to the conversations about we have this infrastructure now um, that allows us to take free resource, i.e. sunlight, and provide it to people in a way that we didn't use to. Knowledge is like is like sunlight, right? If we can build the right infrastructure, whether it's for renewable energy or whether it's for sharing knowledge freely, um, we now have the capacity to, um, uh, to do that. <laughs> and there are you know, forces that have led us to where we are right now uh, that, you know, thank God they were there at the time, you know, it helped, it, it certainly helped a lot of, uh, uh, with a lot of development, but we now have the opportunity to really build something new and better uh, that, that meets the challenges of this moment. Uh, Lisa, hand. Yeah, I just I want to respond to that and to what James just said as well. Um, you know, I worry about the statement that everybody knows we benefit from literacy because uh, clearly that isn't the case. Not everybody believes that we should be literate. Not everybody believes that we should all be voting. I think we have some of the biggest challenges ever here in the US particularly and in other parts of the world as well around these issues. And this idea that our our knowledge and our public knowledge is under attack is really cause for concern. I mean, Cable, James, you've you know, raised the issues of you know, the fact that we aren't making in, in investments that can be amortized, that, that we don't even in these inclusive access deals that you never actually own the content libraries. Uh, public libraries are facing one of the biggest challenges right now. Publishers won't sell to, to libraries the digital versions. And so even the knowledge that we have so come to uh, expect and sort of demand it in the public access to knowledge for public libraries is under attack for the same challenges that we're having now to open education. So, you know, I agree right up to that point where we understand these things are important, but the idea that not everybody actually is on that same page is critical and what, what I think makes this need for open education that much stronger. Indeed, indeed. Um, so we are, yeah, just about out of time. Um, I'd like to just do a quick go around. Any uh, closing thoughts from the panel? Um, Peter. Yeah, I would just echo what Lisa said. Our knowledge is under attack, and we need to figure out who are, who the other members of the, you know, resistance um, are, or, you know, like, the natural and organic members of the resistance, which is maybe not a resistance. Maybe it's the actual, you know, maybe we're, we could just flip it. Um, <laughs> and, but like those groups that are active promoting the goals that are in our vision statements are our natural allies. And we need to, echoing what everybody here has said, find them all over the world and figure out ways of working with them. Uh uh, James, can't improve on that. Closing I thought. Leave it with. Yep. Leave it with okay. uh, Peter. All right, uh, Lisa. Any closing thoughts? I think the the call to action was my definitely my closing my closing thought. Take, okay. let's, take let's take back public knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Cable, closing thoughts. Uh, uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I, I dropped it in chat. Let's make sure that uh, all publicly funded resources are openly licensed and freely available to the public that paid for it. And let's make sure we, we hold those resources in perpetuity. Good, good, good. All right, uh, on behalf of my, uh, my panelists here, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Uh, it was a great conversation. Let's go get them. All right, have a good conference. <laughs>